An author's mind is an expanse of stories waiting to be told. What if two minds work together to weave such tale? The endless reaches of imagination could become a wonderland of possibilities. And it all starts with plot. In today's episode, Clark Chamberlain is here to chat about masterminding your story with a collaborative partner. This is The Writer's Journey. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the beauteous Kayleen Williams. Our guest has been privileged to work with the New York Times bestselling authors, edit hundreds of books, and teach thousands of writers the emotional impact of fiction. Yet he still considers himself a student of story. His passion for the sto study of story drives him forward, and he shares his discoveries in easy-to-learn lessons, working one-on-one -on -one with authors of all levels. He is the co-host of the Book Editor Show, creator of multiple creative writing courses, author of five books, believer of dreams, and once toward his cooler from the mouth of a bear. Clark Chamberlain, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here with you ladies. And we're really happy to have you back. Um, it's been quite some months since you were on to talk about plot. And now we're going to talk tonight about how to work with a partner to get the best story ever. Uh, which is something Kayleen and I, we've done a little bit of working with, with her book and she's helped me on my book. And now we've got the expert here to explain how you work with authors too to help get the best out of their story. Yeah, yeah I'm really excited because it is, um, and we're seeing it more and more. Um, if we look at it coming from the world of television where you have a writer's room and you've got all these people that are smart and they've got all bring their different things, uh, skills to that work and it makes a better work. And we're seeing it a lot and a lot more with co-authoring and working well with an editor that's not just sending it away, you know, actually having these conversations. So I'm very excited to talk about this. Now, uh, how do you work with authors? You were talking about writers in a writer's room with TV and they're all in the same room together around the table, putting their heads together. How do you do that with people that you're, you're in Idaho and they're on the other side of the country? Well, so thank goodness for Zoom. You know, and these types of different tools that allow us to be able to communicate. It's so, because that's a really important part. I, I found when I was very first writing and working with an editor that I would just send off the work. They would send back a whole bunch of red notes on everything, you know, and not really ever having that come. Right. I know. You know, it's like, wow, I don't remember using red font for this entire book, but there it is. And <laughs> Not being able to have that conversation was something I didn't even realize how much I was missing from that. So I love being able to have these calls. Um, I've got clients in Australia and England, Scotland, and Thailand, like all over the place. And you know, sometimes I'm having to be up in the middle of the night to have that call, but it makes it so much better to be able to talk things out. Um, make sure that I understand what it is that they're trying to deliver and then help them do that the best they can. So, yeah. what do you mean by, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Tim. I was just say lines of communication are hugely important. Um, for example, one manuscript I'm editing right now for a client, you know, they're using another language for certain words in, like, military type speak. So, instead of saying, like, yes, brother, you know, they're using different language for that. And so, like, I come across that and I'm like, what does this mean? Because all I'm pulling up is bread. Unless they're talking about making recipes, I don't think that's true. And, you know, they tell me, no, it means this, this, and that. And I'm like, oh, now I can help you with the context. Wonderful. Okay. Right. Yeah. You have to be able to have uh, the same language. You've got to know what it is when someone says this. So that's exactly what they mean. I'll get a, so for instance, um, someone sends me like maybe a plot outline. And I go through this whole plot outline and I'm putting in notes. Um, before I send it back to them, sometimes I'll have additional questions. Is this the direction you're trying to go? Uh, who is it that you're trying to reach with this, with the audience? That's such an important part, you know, that we forget that, um, that the audience actually can change the direction of a story if you really want to connect with them. Because mm -hmm. the stuff you might be putting in there isn't actually going to target or hit or like resonate with that audience. And so there'll be parts where maybe this, we need to tone it back, or we need to actually add this additional element to your protagonist so that they can connect better with that reader. So as a masterminder, as a collaborative partner, one of the things you're thinking about is 
the author that I'm talking to, uh, what's the common language that we share, <laughs> collaborative partners, uh, what is the common language that we'll need to use to communicate to this genre specific audience, my targeted audience, um, and also what medium are we gonna use? Are we gonna be doing a phone call? Are we gonna do Zoom? Um, what else do you mean by masterminding? Let's just kind of- Okay, so um, masterminding could be, because I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, and I don't know that you would necessarily call that a mastermind because, uh, so the mastermind group that I'm in, you know, there's five of us and we get on a call every Thursday and uh, we bring our problems because that's the whole thing about this collaborative effort is that there's something that I need help with and I want to talk, talk it out, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or with a group. Um, it can be very beneficial to be able to pull that stuff all together. Uh, and I don't know, do you want to get into like what you should look for with a mastermind or like that whole process? Yeah, Whatever yeah. you want to give us, we're going to soak it in right. and I should have a notebook to take notes. <laughs> okay. So let's say that uh, you're getting started with this idea. You want to join a mastermind um, or maybe you want to assemble your own mastermind. One of the first things you should look at is who, how large should it be? You know, like, because if you have this mastermind or you're looking at joining this mastermind and there's 20 people in it, how much are you really going to get from that? How many, how many times per week or per month or per year are you actually going to be able to be in what they call the hot seat um, where I'm the one asking the question and getting feedback? So the smaller the group, you're going to have more opportunity to actually get up in front and work out some of these problems. Um, so if you're starting it, though, what uh, some of the things you want to look for or if you're joining one is what's the level, you know, like uh, it's that idea of, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. That's not going to help me. You know, like, are there going to be different levels in there? People that are better than I am. Um, maybe people that are not as good as I am so that I can help them. You know, like everyone's on this journey to, uh, kind of together and we're all at these different levels. So that's something you want to make sure is you're not going to be the smartest person in the room. Other, otherwise, what kind of benefit are you going to get from that? Um, there are masterminds that you pay for. I, uh, I've never joined one of those particularly, um, but maybe that's something you should look at. And then, of course, if you're paying for any of this kind of stuff, uh, no matter what, like you're making sure that uh, the people are going to be delivering, that you know the expectations and that you're going to be getting your money's worth from that. So even more so, like if you're joining something that's paying and there's 50 members, 20 members, whatever, like that's a real question. Am I going to really get any benefit from this? especially because I'm putting up a financial um, investment in it as well. So Sam, I'm a, I'm a would-be space opera author, and I know that I like to get some feedback on the plot that I'm developing. I could get a group of four of my space opera friends together, uh, start a Facebook group or a messenger chat, or um, say we're meeting on Zoom every Thursday night, and we yeah. can start bouncing ideas off each other is that the idea? Yeah, that's the idea. Like, so, um, and you hit it right there, Lauren, is that it's people that share the same genre, that share the same interests. You know, like maybe maybe you're in a group that uh, that you're trying to market. And so having people understand the marketing. But if it's more of, a, of the content building, of the story building, then yeah, like you don't, if you are a space opera author, writer, you're not going to jump into a, a romance mastermind and get a ton of benefit. There might be some, but you're not going to get as much as if you were with that whole group, e even in a sci-fi genre, right? Like, so the rest of them do that, maybe not specifically down to the subgenre, but you got to be there with people who understand the audience. So how would you run one of those masterminding sessions? Like, uh, would you take turns and do all five people in one night or, or, like give 20 minutes or 15 minutes to one person so that we all focus on one person's plot? Like how would we set yeah, so would set yeah. So let's say um, you, you've set one up, you're starting this, um, you've kept it at a good number. Five is pretty good because then people can usually get through the entire group um, before the end of the call. Like if you, even if you're just doing an hour long call, that you assign amount of time. Um, hey, now it's your turn to do this. Another good thing about masterminds is accountability. 
So like mm-hmm. the, the one mastermind group that I'm in, you know, we start with accountability. What, what did we commit to the week before and did we accomplish that? And we run through real quick with everybody. And then we get into the, what you'd call the hot seat. And now who wants to go first or, you know, that you have it on the agenda that this is the order we go in. And maybe you've got uh, someone new that's the first one every time. Cause maybe, maybe this week um, one of your members needs a little bit more time than the other ones do. Right. And that they've got a bigger problem because that's what it's all about is helping people overcome the issues that we've got, you know, and the questions that we've got, and especially right now. Um, so I was on a call, uh, you know, doing the story consultation with an author the other day, and she just is out of the, um, the creativity, you know, like she's a, she's a full time author, you know, putting out stuff all the time. And right now during this crisis, uh, she's just is hit this wall. You know, and so we've been really working through not just necessarily the story, but also like how can how can we do some more things? Do we need to have a, a daily check in to make sure that you're accomplishing what it is? You know, um, how do we change this up so that you can gain some of that creativity back? Because that's a terrible thing is to lose that creativity. You know, a lot of a lot of what you're kind of saying, this is. um this is really like a mini family or a group that you can count on to. It's like, you know, y'all are my people that I can just be like, I have this crap going on. I just need to vent for a minute. My plot's not coming out. This stuff's happening. And then they're just like, we're here for you, buddy, Bella. And I, I'm actually in a, in a group of one of those. And I feel really bad because I have not been on the call for like the last three months or so just because I have so much going on that like, I just either, I forget it's Tuesday, (laughs) which happens a lot. um, Or I just, I just can't. And so that's, that's one thing I kind of want to address is when you're in one of these, you know, mastermind type groups of um, that there are people that you can trust as well, you know, because, and everybody needs to understand that not everybody's going to be there every week or every two weeks or whatever it is the group decides um, that they're going to be showing up and doing doing the calls. Um, so that's that's been hugely helpful for me is because I, I haven't been there in so long, but they still check in on me every now and then. Yeah. Like, um, hello, <laughs> where have you been? And I'm like, I'm sorry. So just knowing that they're there waiting for me to get my crazy under control long enough that I can be there for that hour is also hugely helpful as well. So. Right. They can think back, you know, like if you ever took a creative writing class in, in college or high school, you know, and you're in there with a, a group of 20, 30 other students or something like that, and you do these critique sessions, right. And you don't trust maybe not even half of the people, maybe it's less than half the people, you know, how can, how can you move forward with confidence if you can't trust the people that you're with. So yes, that's a huge part of it. Like making sure that you're with a group that you can trust, that you can rely on. Um, And then also like if you're setting this group up or if you're looking for a group, what are their expectations? You know, is it a group? Because I've been in a group where it's just, we come together and just chat and just kind of unload, you know, like just, I need to talk with another writer who gets this lifestyle and we can just talk for a while about whatever. And we're not really solving a problem. We're just being there for each other. It's almost like a group session of just getting stuff out and just being heard for a moment. Now that's the expectation for the group. Then that's awesome. Um, if you know, like if you go into a group that's more directed towards we're, we're helping each other do better with our marketing and then it sidetracks all the time into that. I'm just going to talk about my, my personal life problems, that's not helping as much, right? You know, so like once in a while it's going to happen, but making sure, you know, that you kind of keep on track and you've got to have someone who's in charge of that, right? You know, maybe someone who's organized the group or that they're the people who take the notes, you know, that keep the, what everyone committed to the week before, like that's you know, really helpful to be able to have someone to say, oh, you know, okay, that's cool. And uh, let's get back and who's got this problem or however you're running that. So knowing what the expectations are for the group, what the group's purpose is, that's mm-hmm. another big thing. So, cause yeah, you can have, uh, absolutely it's cool. You can put together a group that's just about socialization, 
that's cool. But like, make sure that that's, everybody knows what that's what the group is about. You know, mm -hmm. we're just coming together and just hanging out. And the, the Zoom is going to be open for it. we got a room every week that we're just going to be there. We're going to be there for an hour, two hours, whatever, and drop in. And it's no huge expectations. But, um, and then those other groups, you know, that uh, you want to commit more. And you want to be there more for them and for you. Yeah, I guess that time limit might be pretty helpful for keeping people on track. And yeah. Zoom, Zoom would be a great platform for using it, for doing this. Uh, Facebook, you know, obviously Facebook groups and Facebook, the rooms that they're setting up now on Facebook. And Discord, you could set up a Discord channel and use that to do uh, video chats as well as having um, threads. Yeah, and I would say, you know, even if you don't want to have your camera on, being able to have it more in the video type, being able mm -hmm. to do audio and not just a, a bunch of text, um, a bunch of, you know, like replies, because someone usually always takes over in the replies and then part of the group probably doesn't feel like they have anything important to say or don't know how to say it. But being able to actually have a conversation, real conversation like we're having right now, that's mm -hmm. that's better. That's That's the goal, you know, so you can actually feel like I can talk, I can say mm -hmm. what it is I'm actually thinking, and then not having someone that's just grabbing, because that happens, you know, you, you're going to always have someone in the group that's a little bit more, um, not overbearing, that's the wrong term, but kind of vocal? like that, right? vocal, yes, you know. Wordly vocal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. You want everyone to be able to be free to share. And feel like they're free to share, right? You know, because mm -hmm. you, if you're, um, Let's just say, for instance, that you're the one who's running the group and you have this one person who just brings negativity or, you know, shoots down everybody's ideas or, you know, just is always just this negative. At some point, maybe you need to just block them from the group or have that conversation. you got to tone it down. It's one, one strike, two strikes, and then it's gone. Because if you have this one person that's always negative and then that starts breaking down the rest of the group, they don't feel like they could even show up. Again, that's not that's not where you're going. It doesn't have to be all like everyone's just positive and, you know, yeah, it, that's exactly what you need to do. No, but you've got to have that balance between this, you know, and making no, sure. I, I totally know what you're, when I very, very first started um, getting into the indie published world, and this was, God, six, seven years ago, I was a part of a, a local author group. And it always devolved very quickly, like within the first five to 10 minutes into how do we get our books into libraries every single time? Because th there was one person who was obsessed with getting their books into libraries and it upset her so much that she couldn't and she couldn't figure out how every single session turned into how do we get our books into libraries? And I'm just like, I'm done. I can't, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't helping me anymore. And I love you all, but. Right, like if oh, I get it, it, I totally get it. Yeah, and if it's if the group's not helping you personally, then it's time to look for another group. I was with a a, a group of middle grade authors for a while, and it was same similar. Like every session was just about, oh, we're not in the Scholastic newsletter, and how can we possibly sell books? And woe is us, and this is, but we'd never come up with any solutions, you know, like and so. <laughs> And then Again. you try to, and everyone shoots them down. And yeah. Like, okay. why am I even trying? <laughs> yeah, like, what, you know, um, there's always going to be the person who tried something one time and it didn't work. And so it certainly can't work for anyone else either. You know, like, that's mm -hmm. that kind of negativity is the wrong direction you want to go. You got to be with a group who's going to be able to think outside the box, tackle something. They can say, hey, you know what? I tried that before and it didn't work. And this is why it didn't work. Not mm -hmm. that it can't work again, you know, like, like being able to relook at those types of things. Um, Cause yes, yeah, so like any of us who've been in this industry for a long time, we get, we start believing that this is the way it is. This is the only thing that can work, you know, even though that this is industry is constantly changing, you know, a month by month, things can change drastically in, in how we deliver, how we connect uh, and how we find our audiences. Let's say I've got my space opera group together and we're going to focus on uh, coming up with awesome plots. And each of us has our own series and we, we, we each want to write our own series. So they're all separate and different. And I've got my five people or six people. I've got Shadow in my group. I've got James McCormick in my group. I've got Rick Partlow in my group, Clark Chamberlain and, and Keeling Williams. That's my group of, that's, that's six. <laughs> anyway. Talk it out. Nice. It's us. 
Uh, and we're going to meet every Friday morning, say, and we're going to come up with plots. How would you run this group and keep us focused on, you know, tell me what your plot idea is and let's all kind of work together to make that plot stronger and to pull ideas out of you. How would you run that group? So if, you, if it was specifically designed to come up with plot ideas, I would say that you should have some type of, um, like, I'm going to send this plot to everybody first so that I don't mm -hmm. have to sit there explaining the plot, right? It's almost like I'm going to send you guys my homework. Everyone is responsible to read that to come and, you know, so that's a commitment level thing, right? You know, that you've got this commitment to this group. And part of that commitment is every week, we re maybe it's just one person's because yeah. I think if you were trying to do that would five, be a lot of, I was just thinking that's a lot of plot yeah. to go through. In a week. Right. So, so maybe it's just one person's each week we tackle one person's plot, which means that I'm only committed to read one plot per week, right? I'm not mm -hmm. trying to read five or six ideas. I just read one and I go there and I've got my ideas so that we can start talking and breaking it down. Mm -hmm. And that that person is there. Um, I would start with questions first with, um, making sure that everybody understood what it was about and what they were. So like any kind of qualifying questions, I would start with that, um, making sure that everyone understands where you're, where you're going, target audiences. Is this going to be a series, you know, like how many books are in this series? Like where does that go? Those are really important questions. You know, that uh, sometimes we forget we write one book and then we have no idea where we're going with the next one, but having that stuff up front, that's going to be the benefit of this group. So I would do that that way. And then, um, start going around, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody's can ask the, the questions first, you know, making sure we understood everything, um, then general ideas, and then digging in more specifically. And I would, um, I would, you probably have to work it out just a little bit to, to work, find that best method. But my guess would be that you would break it down by act structure. We're going to go through mm -hmm. the first act. We're going to go through the second act, you know, that you would look at very specific things. Um, where's the plot structure of this? What's the climax? Like, why is the climax? Has it connected back with everything that's happened? You know, those are the things that I would start looking at. Very specific um, plot questions. What resources would you recommend for someone who's like, I have no idea what he means by acts and plot structure. Um, where should they start? Uh, the book editor show. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, sure. we, very, right. no we are. We got a lot of really good specifics. Um, but uh, if I was to recommend one book that would probably help you come up with better ideas on how to do this is writing the breakthrough novel. Uh, it's a fantastic, it's a workbook. Get the workbook one. Like that's a really good way to actually start looking at the whole situation and really getting a good idea of how to make it better. Um, I, I actually have this one here. This I didn't have this prepared for the show. I was just reading it uh, the other day when I was working with someone. Uh, this is another really good one, 20 Master Plots uh, by Ronald Tobias. And it goes through and breaks down like essential plots that we've seen over and over again. And so if, not genre specific plots, but just plot structures. So like mm. the so chase. Like, like tropey things, like, you know, there's going to be a big action scene, some kind of big boom, boom, pew, pew. And <laughs> You know, yes. military, or you know, uh, there could be pew pew in um, crime stuff. You know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, like, in this one, I say, you know, like, it's not genre specific, but say that you're doing a a revenge plot, you know, and then you can look in here because a revenge plot could be in anything, any genre, and so then he. Uh, discusses what should be in it. You know, at the end, I really like these because he has a checklist, things you keep in mind. Uh, first point escape is always literally your hero should be confined against his will and wants to escape. Oh, that's the escape plot, <laughs> not the revenge plot. <laughs> um, what what oh, was that book again? Because that so sounds it's rather 20, 20 master plots. So, and how to build them. And I like the book. Like, um, there's a lot of really great books. Those are just a couple off the top of my head that I can think of would be a good spot to go. Um, resource wise, uh, oh, what is her name? All of a sudden, I'm going to forget it. Writers mm -hmm. Becoming Authors. Is that her? The, um, let me look this up real quick. Talk amongst yourselves just for a second. So, I, since he's looking that up, I will say. Um, a lot of what goes into a plot, you know, people really get stuck on this. You know, they're, they're world building. They haven't even yet found their characters. They're sort of kind of figuring out what the story is going to be about. Um, one 
I mean, just with what he said, it's a revenge story. I mean, that that can lead so many little, you know, lines, nooks and crannies, um, little tidbits of where of what you can put in your story, um, just from that emotional standing point. You know, if, if you can find that encompassing emotion, and it could be a tree of emotion, it could be a revenge plot that is um, hugged in the warm blanket of a murder mystery that is, you know, held up on the bed of a sci-fi space station. Look, we just built a story. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, if you look at the, the reboot of Battlestar Galactica, it was a political drama set in space you know like it it had all these other different types of elements but if you're like really breaking it down like what is it about like it was always political drama back and forth but it had a lot of action in it had all these other types of stuff so like yeah that is a good way to keep on track of what it is you're trying to create uh km wyland it's her website is helping authors or helping writers become authors.com uh, she discusses a lot about structure of, of story structure and getting into the acts whereas the plot points uh midpoints climax like and really i think has done a really good job of of spelling out what those terms are and how to use them it's really kind of funny that uh you know it's almost like when you've learned to speak your native language you don't mm -hmm. understand necessarily what the rules are. You understand how it sounds and how it sounds wrong. And we're all natural storytellers in that sense. But a lot of times we don't understand the specific rules and understanding mm -hmm. those rules will help you plot better. It'll help you make stronger stories. Dude, so would it be helpful? Flash I was going to say, I was getting flashbacks to the show about better English knowledge. I forget what the title of her own show was, but yeah, she was blowing my mind all over the place. And it's sounding like there's a lot even in like this 20 master plots the website that you just mentioned that i have already forgotten i'm totally sorry um can blow your mind on the own knowledge and verbiage of to be an author please god the lord save me it sounds like your group needs to have the same language so it might be helpful if you're all reading larry brooks's book for example on the um for act structure or you're reading Save the Cat, or yeah. you're reading, is it Cam Wiley? The lady you just recommended. Oh, Cam Wyland. Cam, Cam Wyland, yeah. If you are if you focus on one plot structure together as a group, maybe that would help you to have the same common language. Yeah, it really could. And you know that's uh, one of the things that uh, Peter Turley on the Book Editor Show that we try to do all the time. And we tackle one thing. You know, like mm -hmm. when we talk about a book, you know, we go through the book uh, and really, break it down on how it works. Or like uh, in my advanced novel writing with Harry Potter, like I took the first book and just breaking it down and breaking down the terminology of what this book is about and what it's doing each in, the, in each of the chapters. So yeah, being able to have that same uh, language with your group, super important. Um, I, I don't even remember her name. Uh, it was a long time ago I read this, you know, she was trying to do sci-fi. She wasn't spending a lot of time reading a lot of other sci-fi, you know, and so she's making up stuff that honestly has been made up a bajillion times before and if if you're in that community like the, it's already kind of one of those things this is a trope that we can use and this is what we call it already it was already there and she didn't have to reinvent the wheel so spending time reading in the genre that you want to write mm -hmm. that's important <laughs> yeah and that's where that mastermind would help because the other people in your group yep. would do that if you call you on it um, yeah, I've, I've spent the first half of this year trying to come up with plots <laughs> on my own. And um, one of the things I've run into is <laughs> they have come out kind of cheesy and um, cliched and anything pushed to come up with something better. Um, but yeah, in my, in my writer's cave, that's kind of where I'm at, is yeah. uh, banging my head against walls. That's not a good place to be. That doesn't feel so nice, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, but, you know, on the other side, with uh, when you start doing a plot and you put the ideas, the main ideas together, it can change a lot once you get into the writing process. You know, with, right. uh, you know, the characters can take it in different directions, stuff that you hadn't seen before. Uh, some of those things that you really feel are generic or cliche at this moment, you'll find different ways to write those and make them better and stronger. Mm. 
That's true. <laughs> so. I've heard some other advice, like, if you need a plot twist, come up with 10 different ideas. Because the first seven are going to be cliché, or they're going to be obvious reaches, and you, you push yourself the, the last three, you might, you might come up with something good. But coming up with three for me is hard. Well, just a couple, you know, it's just... <laughs> Like what else could I, I don't know. One of the things that I would always suggest, you know, anytime when you're putting things together is think about the, the stakes, personal stakes, mm -hmm. community stakes and global stakes. So there are things that the protagonist specifically doesn't want to lose, you know, things that you can put at risk for that individual. The protagonist always has a community, right? Whether the, you know, it's uh, other characters that, travels with you know like if you're doing a military it's a squad uh how can you put the squad more at risk mm -hmm. and then on the largest level you know is how can you put the entire world at risk you know and look mm -hmm. at each one of those things and how you can increase it to add more additional stakes to the drama mm -hmm. all right we'll go back into stakes but first we're going to take a quick break for our book spotlight all righty, key strokers, all the strokers out there. Today's book spotlight is two authors, one book, co-writing Murder Free by Rhett Bruno and Steve Bollier. Four hands are faster than two. The stars of every major entertainment industry have benefited from creative collaboration from Spielberg and Lucas to Lennon and Mc... Oh my God, McCartney, I even practiced it, damn it. To Jordan and Pippin. Why not take a page out of the book of the greats and use a tried and true method to produce quality books faster? In this book, you will learn almost everything necessary to co-write and release your next book, including how to identify a potential writing partner, how to identify your combined goals, how to test each other, how to develop a method that works for your individual team, how to decide what kind of team you are and which co-writing style to use, how to write and share responsibilities, how to decide what programs and applications to use, how to effectively prepare and release your completed book, how to set yourself up for the most earning potential. Whether self-published or traditionally, traditionally published, these lessons will help you keep your new team together and your hands free of murder. Trust us, neither of us is dead yet of doom. Click by now, you collaborators out there. Excellent. So if I'm coming up with my own plot or I'm collaborating with someone else, how important is it for me to know what the stakes are at the start before I start writing? Not important. I would say if you are very first starting, like trying to come up with a plot, start with the end. Understand where it is that you're going with the end. Um, mm -hmm. How do I want the climax to look at this? You know, what, mm -hmm. what's that? And reverse engineer things and start working your way backward. Um, that's one I of the easier my ways to do it. Yeah. And and the reason why I say that is if you can get really hung up. The term world building comes to mind. Spending so much time creating all this type of smaller stuff before you actually get into putting the plot together. You know, if you know where the end's at and you can like create a log line, uh, you know, a person, a place in the uh, with a problem and then what's the payoff? I've added a fourth P to my P's. So, uh, which really helps people to come up with that and putting that log line together and then just putting together like a three act structure, not a three act structure, a, a paragraph for what's going to happen in each of the three acts, just basic stuff. Like this is where I want it. Get that real basic building blocks out. And then you can start going in and seeing where you need to increase stakes and problems and what needs to happen from scene to scene. How do I get them? Because that's where you should start. You know, you're always starting with that end and then that uh, basic idea and then going through like, what's the inciting incident? What's transpiring from the first act to the second act? You know, where's my midpoint at? You know, what additional things are happening at these major spots? And then creating the things in between it. Because if I want to get to, um, I 
I guess, goodness, it's been over a year now, over a year now that, uh, that I put together that little thing on, on plotting. And, um, one of the things I was discussing in there, like, I love this book called Tishomingo Blues. Um, and in the end of it, it's got a, a mob group from Chicago. It's got this high diver, professional high diver, and then uh, the, the redneck mob. And they're down at a Civil War reenactment battle deal. And that's where the climax takes place. And so how do you get there? How do you get all these people into this place? You know, and so then you're starting to look and work your way, reverse engineering that and putting it all together. Hmm. I, yeah, I maybe, have to, maybe that's my problem. I have to say, if I did not know what I want this whole thing to come out from, I would be a crazy person. Um, because like I just I just wrote a short story in less than a week which is really, really fast for me. Like y'all don't even understand. This is like Astro, I just like hit like a thing up here that I didn't even know was possible for me. And, but the, the, the thing is, is I knew exactly where I wanted the end to be. I wanted um, this sort of emotion to be going on. And I wanted this particular thing to be the hero. I, I can't say what it is yet because it's not published yet. So, um, but through that, you know, the beginning and the middle, I mean, it went through quite a few different changes in that time, but my goal was always this emotional endpoint and knowing that helped immensely. <laughs> yep. Because if you don't put a target on where it is you're trying to go, you might as well just be pantsing. I mean, you know, just, you know, just write. So, but if you really want to take advantage of what plotting is and putting things together, you got to have that end at the very beginning. Like you gotta know where it is you're trying to go. And I just wanna say, pantsers out there, I am a pantser through and through. Like I try to outline and then it turns into this never ending mess of I'm never gonna write the book. Um, so I have to do super duper minimal. You know, I know exactly where I want the ending to be and then like maybe something cool in the middle. And then I'm just in there and just like all these things and I'm just do do do. And no, I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go over here. This is why I can never, anyway, but yeah. Uh, pantsers, know your ending. Pantsing will be funner, you know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it, it should be, you know, like, cause then you know where it is you're going and you don't get stuck. And then you can jump ahead. Maybe, you know, you're stuck on a scene, but then you can jump ahead cause you know what that next scene is gonna mm -hmm. be because it's more directly connected to the end. Um, another idea that I, I like these days is I tell people to, what kind of fun stuff would you like to see your characters do in the mm. book? You know, write up a huge list of things that could be fun. And by fun, I just mean things that you would love to see. I'd like to see these people, like one of the things with my Hank Hudson book, uh, the second one, I wanted them riding in a motorcycle with a sidecar. That was just a fun thing that I wanted to have in there. And how can I put that in there and how can it work? Um, you know, just creating that list of things you would like to see and those types of scenes that you can put together and where can they fit? Um, that can just be a really good exercise of, of putting this stuff together. I want them to have this really big gunfight, or I want to have that feeling of the good and the bad and the ugly where they're having this huge standoff, you know, where I'm zooming in really close on the eyes and, you know, they're just yeah, staring I, each other down. I will say I, I'm feeling that one because in um, my collaborative work that's coming out soon. Um, I specifically wanted raining confetti. I wanted an explosion of confetti, like a freaking confetti party. And it's a military sci-fi book. <laughs> and my co-writer is like, we're not having confetti. I'm like, we're having confetti and it's happening. And I'm gonna mm -hmm. figure out a way to make this confetti happen. And I did it. Nice. It's confetti <laughs> in the military sci-fi and I'm so excited. <laughs> And uh, it, it, that's one of the things, though. Like, if you, it helps to be excited about what you're going to write. Mm -hmm. If you're not feeling it, and you don't have those things, you're like, goodness, this, I'm really excited to try to put this together. What's going to keep you writing? You know, what's going to keep you motivated to get to that next spot? Hmm. So even if it's a cliche, like, how can you make it not cliche? You know, like. Um, one of the cliches in most middle grade is, you know, you've got to get the kid away from the parents. And a lot of times the parents die, you know, like that's just like a normal thing. And so I was like, well, how can I get my, my kid away from the parents? What if I make them old, not just make them old, but like magically 
all of a sudden now they're old and senile, you know, and so that they no longer are there. Like that's a change on that normal cliche. So yeah, just look for different ways to, to subvert the expectation. So when you're plotting and you know your tropes, you know, you've, you've, you've seen the tropes, you know your genre, what, what readers are expecting to find, because they're still going to want to find those. They're still going to find, like you said, that the parents are gone, but they don't have to be dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, have you seen the Joker movie? Joker. The, which one? The, the, the last one. The movie Joker. Maybe. So, okay. So, uh, super sad movie, like ridiculously, like just made me like just depressed and all this type of stuff. It's, uh, has mentions of, you know, the, the Bruce Wayne family has mentions of Gotham. We have Joker, but it's not, it doesn't hit the rest of those superhero tropes. And so mm -hmm. like that, it was almost like we've got this really cool story. Can we borrow the names <laughs> of your DC Universe stuff that we can just toss it on top of, and then we can, you know, get some people excited about it? So, because it, if I'm oh, going in, sad, right? Yeah. So if I go into something, I've got certain expectations as a reader, as a viewer, and if those aren't met, even if it's really good, you can still feel let down. It's like that it wasn't in in the Batman universe. I just <laughs> it wasn't superheroes. So it sounds like you need to think about what do what fun things do you love and do you want to have in your story. But then once you have that scene in your mind of what you want to include, you got to think what makes it fun for the reader, or yep. what makes it um, sad or painful or exciting or terrifying for the reader. And then how can I um, how can I leverage that? How can I emphasize that? Right. And and again, when I say the word fun, I don't mean that it's jolly fun and and yeah. everything. what. Do you think would be fun? It could be that you know that uh, you're doing a, a horror genre book, you know, and it, it's this super scary moment, right? You know, and that's a fun thing you want to see in the book, right? You know, it's fun for you to write it, not that it's fun. It's it's not a you know a happy happy joy joy. Right. It's something it's, that you're excited about writing. It's something it that happy, you want to see. Joy, joy. Be, right. It just doesn't mean that that is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just read Ready Player One. That book feels like it was planned, plotted, written, edited from, you know, from start to finish all on love. This guy loves the 80s so much and his characters love the 80s so much. It drives the plot. It drives um, the prose. And I can see where he, he thought about everything that he loves about the 80s. Let's put this in the book. Right. And he fits it in. It's good. No, the book is really good. Much better than the movie was. Um and exactly, like, what are those things that you want to see in that? And so that can help uh, design additional scenes. Because, yeah, you're going to have these pillar scenes, right? Uh, inciting incident, climax, midpoint, uh, dark night of soul type of things. Those are going to be very pillar, and they're going to be in your mind. You've got a lot of scenes in between. What do you want to see happening, and how can you arrange those in a way that will make it easier for you to put that down on paper to plot it? And then, of course, which should catapult you, helping you into write it. Um, one thing I actually want to get back to or circle back on uh, the book that you had talked about, like understand that a, that a mastermind is not a writer's room, right? You know, mm -hmm. like you could have a, a collaborative writing group where you're working on the same thing, right? And you don't want that to um, fall apart into a group high school project where you've got one person who does all the work and everyone else is just kind of along for the ride. Okay. So like, when you've got that collaborative writing group, even more so that you're wanting to set those expectations. What is everybody's job? What are they supposed to be doing? What are they going to contribute every week? So that you don't have someone who's just writing the coattails. Yeah. Slapping the other person's name on it. Yeah. Can you give examples of how you would set of different roles there could be and how you would set that up? Well, if you if you take a look like at a traditional writer's room, you know, you have a, a showrunner, the person who's overall in charge of everything. Um, you could actually set it up with you assemble a group that you have one person who's amazing at writing dialogue. Another person is much better at doing settings. Uh, someone who is your overarching um, plot and making sure that everything is is, especially if you're going from series to series, I, the word is escaping me right now, but that they understand 
he had a black leather book in the last one that he carried with him. And we got to make sure that that's in here. Continuity, like someone who's keeping that continuity with everything that's going from book to book. Um, but you got to have that lead person. Someone has to be in charge of the circus, you know, because other than that, it's just going to devolve and fall apart. Yeah, you definitely have to have a leader and right out of the gate for everybody. Sorry to interrupt you. No. Um, um, like one-on-one -on -one collaborations where it's you and another person, you're writing a series together. Um, one of you has got to be the lead guy in like the, the final decision maker, the, the one who's like, this is this, the sentence is fine. The scene is fine. No, there's not going to be a Sarah, you know, whatever the thing is, there's got to be that person who ends discussion. Um, because if not, then just like Clark saying, it ends, it just becomes chaos. You know, it's the, it's like a, anyway, but yeah, that's all I had. Yeah, no, that's a, it's so, so important. Um, another thing that I do when I'm doing consultation work, you know, the first thing I do when I get on the call, I say, you know, like, this is your time. This is all about you, but I need to know what your expectations for, for this call are for, you know, or, or, or what your expectations are during this call. So that when you're done, that you feel satisfied that we've accomplished what it is. And I write that down. And then when we get to the end, I circle back. Did we meet that expectation? You know, like having clear expectations is so important because if you've got someone coming in, you're doing, you know, a, a smaller mastermind group, you know, or, or doing con consulting with someone and they don't meet expectations or they don't even talk about expectations, then you might end up feeling like, oh, they never really listened to anything that I was I was after. Um, <laughs> I've had two, I don't know if it's the, the, the VA, the Veterans Administration's uh, counselors are all like this, but I've had two of them now that they just want to talk the entire time and they guess what the problem is and they immediately grab solutions for it without actually listening to what the problem is and what I need to talk about. And so that can be super frustrating. So again, like you can uh, put that over into any type of writing group, collaborative group, mastermind, uh, consultations. You know, if you're not being heard and they don't really even understand what the problem is, which is what I was saying, like if you're doing the plots that you take a moment to make sure people ask questions that they understood what that plot was about or what was going on there. Um, it's, it's super important. Again, it all falls back to communication, like making sure that you understand each other. All right. Now, Kayleen, she elicited questions from the audience and we do have a question for you already. Yes. Cormick asks, he mentioned having a start and an end. What is something he does to help make it through the long muddy middle? Oh, mm. that middle. That middle. Yes. And it is a lot of problems. Um, cause you, you, end up you're like goodness i got all these things and that's where those fun scenes come in like more so than anything like how can i make this something that is interesting to me because if it's interesting to me hopefully it's you know it should translate as interest to them um again pillar points so you have a midpoint and I'll just pretend that you don't know anything at all about things okay, with this stuff. But the we have midpoint, other episodes that explain right. all of these words he's about to use. Yeah. <laughs> but let's just say, for instance, the midpoint. The midpoint changes the protagonist from reacting all the time to then acting and moving forward. So you can look at that as a pillar. And then you have these fun scenes, these things where they're being proactive. Well, then we're going to put those after the midpoint. Things that are reactive scenes go before the midpoint. You know, th that type of idea, you know, like if you can get that idea into your head, those types of structure points, things that, scenes that happen between these, how can you do that? How can you do it better? Um, just putting that on the right side is going to help. And then if you're really just struggling and struggling, well, just cut it down. You know, like just leave it. And then move on to like the next thing and then, you know, restructure that center part because you don't want to just be throwing up words just to fill up space. You know, if it's not working, move past it, write something else and then come back and look at it again. Yeah, I will say um, starting with knowing the ending and then, you know, you're kind of I'm I kind of do this as I'm writing, writing the beginning, the opening is typically one of the very last things that I do. 
And then once I've written that opening, I, I typically find myself back in the middle. Like, is this opening working with this midpoint? And then I already know that it's working with the ending because I knew the ending all along, found my perfect opening. So now I've, now I've got to marry the two from all the things. And, and, and I know that, that some people have a difficult time non-sequential writing, you know, like jumping around from different scenes. It, it's something, you know, that if it's not something you're familiar with, you have to practice it and you have to try. Yeah, and, I, yeah. Yeah. I don't and recommend it, it going, yeah, don't jump around if you're not used to, you know, jump, jump, jump around, don't, don't do it. But <laughs> <laughs> if you're naturally like here, there, and everywhere, um, yeah. Then it can work really well. And if you're not, then it's just a thing you've got to develop like any other skill. Um, and then on top of that, there was one other thing. Eh, I'm it's sorry. gone now. I, br I broke Clark's. Clark's That's thing not hard to break. It's not hard to break what's up here. It's so fragile. Well, it, one thought would be you've got this climax in mind for your story. Um, maybe if your middle is getting muddy and you're getting closer to that climax, and you're like, no, slow down. I'm not, I need to have more scenes in between here and the climax. Maybe that climax is not climactic enough. Mm -hmm. Right. And that goes back to the, the, the stakes idea. So maybe the climax you have only affects the community. And maybe that then you'll move that back to your midpoint or back to the dark night and then the soul. And then you do something bigger that's more world threatening. You know, up the, up the game, up your stakes. Yeah. Yeah. More intense. Yeah. And, um, and just because you have the, the plot structured out to begin with doesn't mean you can't change it. <laughs> you know, that you can change stuff around. Uh, may, you know, may, maybe you have picked the wrong spot that it starts. Maybe it started before there. Maybe it started after there. And maybe there's more stuff at the end, you know, that you could put in instead. So just be flexible. Yeah, absolutely. A tip I've heard it from a number of sources is often the first five pages of your novel don't need to be in there. Mm -hmm. And then the story gets better. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of, uh, you know, the, especially when you're getting into the writing, a lot of it is more about just getting your thoughts out, not necessarily what the story is. That's a really good point. Yeah. I, I will say um, one one story collaborative, collaboratively written, if I could talk tonight. Um, I mean, we had it planned out and we have, you know, our structure of how we work from beginning to finish product. And I'm putting on the finishing touches and I'm like, it's not done. I'm like, we need like one or two more chapters in this beast. Thankfully we had already planned out book two. I literally yanked the first two chapters out of book two and put it at the end of, of book one because it finished out book one stronger than it began book two. So staying flexible and, you know, yeah, staying flexible is also hugely key. We have another question from the chat. Kayleen, you want to read this one for us? All righty. Rick Partlow, he asks, any advice on writing longer books from a first-person point of view? First person I find that the books tend to be shorter than ones I do. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I would start with with first person when you're looking at it I is don't know. It, I, I read the rest of the question. But, did I cut uh, out? You did. You froze there. Yeah, everything died. I kept reading, hoping that didn't happen. <laughs> um, but yes, you're you're muted. <laughs> I broke it! Yay! <laughs> there we go. The rest of the question is, um, I write a lot from first person, and I find that the books tend to be shorter than the ones I do from third person with multiple POVs. Right. Um, so... Think about your first person character as a storyteller, right? Think that they are actually telling the story to somebody. That can really help to then, what in this particular scene would they tell that person? What would they really care about? Some things are more difficult, of course, with first person, especially if you're trying to hide things, which can become more complicated. Again, um, give them a dance scene. I, I don't know if we talked about that one time before or not, but uh, the idea of like, do they care about something else? 
do they have something normal in their life that they do? Um, so that this, especially with the first person, right, they usually have some type of internal goals that they're pursuing for themselves that may be outside of the plot. What does that look like for them? What is their work, play? Like these are ones just to just start, you know, kicking off ideas. Um, how are they at work? How are they at play? How are they at rest? Can I put a scene in there at play with them doing something that they love to do? They have a hobby. They have a, a goal. You know, like even if it's something like they're trying to become, um, get that advancement at work and they need to take a class. Can I put that class scene in there? Right. You know, and have something interesting happen in it. So give yourself time to like work through that, specifically focusing on the protagonist and what they give, what they care about. And uh, I think you can develop a lot of additional scenes off of that. I love that advice because it makes me think of the Harry Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. The main character is its first person, and he's got a really distinct voice. And I think part of it is I feel like he's talking directly to me. <laughs> and I don't know how Jim Butcher started that. Maybe he had a reader in mind when he started writing it, or maybe he's thinking the main character is talking to someone. The series is still quite finished. It's, it's going to be finished soon. And I'm, I've got that question in the back of my mind. What's the reason Harry is telling this, this story to the audience? What is his purpose? And I hope by the last book, we'll figure out what it is. I, yeah. I feel like that might be part of the overall series plot itself. But if I'm an author and I'm writing in first person and I've got my main character, I'm trying to get into his head. If I can think of someone he can talk to, that might make me come up with um, different ways of talking about the setting, uh, different jokes, uh, different um, sorrows that I might share, different uh, flaws that I might have. I might be an unreliable narrator. I might lie to the audience. I might be trying to twist narrative for some reason. It, I think it would help color the prose itself and make the book more interesting. And you can do it in third person. James McCormick, he suggests to wreck, hey, don't write in first, write in third. And third person narrators can have an, a person they're talking to as well. And they can be unreliable too, if they've got some kind of motive and they're still writing in third. Well, yeah. And cause think of your own personal life. You've had an experience and what do you tell with that experience? How do you tell that story, that experience to your friends versus to your parents versus to your coworkers, right? Like that story will be told three different ways to those three different groups. Yeah. yeah. For sure. <laughs> So who is the best uh, recipient, the best listener for the story I'm trying to tell right now? Um, or can bring out that side of my character that I want, that, that will be most fascinating for my readers. Interesting. Like it. All right, well, we've done a lot of talking about masterminding and um, plot and maybe given the audience some ideas. And they might be asking themselves, well, with so much to think about, when do I ever start writing? So what do you think, Clark? Can we over, is it a possibility that we could spend six months thinking about our plot and not writing a single word? Well, you tell yourself enough's enough. I got to start writing. Yeah. Um, I call myself an author these days because I don't write so much anymore. <laughs> you know, I think writers need to write. And um, even if it's just practice. Even if you're just trying out the scene, you're trying out the scene in different ways because you have started your plot. Doesn't mean you have to do the whole thing, right? You're not having to jump in to the next step of writing the entire story, but grab some of those scenes. Um, experiment, first person, third person, uh, limited, close, uh, far points of view. So you can uh, maybe identify that better. Like this is gonna work better if I'm writing it in this different type of thing. I gotta write. Right. You know, like, I mean, if that's what you're wanting to do, you got to write. You know, you you mentioning that um, actually one time I was I was horribly blocked. I mean, I was writing every day, but it was just like everything was absolute curse word. Fucking bullshit. It was just all crap. All of it was crap. Um, and then I started writing it in first person. I just completely started over and I just started writing it in first person. And then all of a sudden it was just like the train started going and then it switched into third person. Cause I, I normally write in third and it was, I was just like, Oh, all right. Freaking. I don't know what that was about, but I'm going now. So yeah, I mean, writing in different viewpoints 
if you're stuck, you know, if you normally write in third, try writing in first. Pick a character that you, like, either the main character or some weird side character. It might not even end up in the book. Just, just, just write it. If you normally write in first, try that beast in third, man. Be the omniscient yeah. know-it-all. Right. And, and I would say that if it's taking you six months to plot, that's a long time to plot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't get stuck six yeah. months. Don't get stuck three months, man. Get... Keep it simple. Yeah. The plot, uh, you know, plotting is all about getting to the writing. So if you're spending all this time doing the plotting, you know, uh, um, I, we did an interview and uh, with a she's amazing world builder and um she's like don't do any world building on the until you've written the first book like that was her idea you know like because you've got these ideas but don't spend all your time trying to build up this world because you're going to find things sometimes you know down down the road so again just keeping things simple and getting to the writing is important i yeah i could not agree more because, yeah, you could, it's so much fun, right, to world build I, and to plot and to sit there doing this stuff and you're never going to get to the writing. You know, yeah. From experience, I will say this, from experience, I spent 13 years world building a universe before I actually wrote the first book. And then when I wrote the first book, you know what ended up happening? Almost half of the 13 years I spent world building flipped on top of its head. Don't lose yourself in hardcore world building it yeah <laughs> it, and you know and that's again i was flexible i was like okay this is where the characters are taking me this is what's happening this needs to tweak i need to add this history and we're still going we're moving we're chugging along so yeah Am I dead? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. both of you are like looking Sorry, like you're I, making sound, but you're I was distracted by the chat. I mean, all kinds of things are happening in the chat right now. And all right. What is the chat doing? I know we're two minutes they're over. Fun. They're having a lot of fun. That's what they're doing. All right. Shadow, I'm gonna tell your wife you said that, Rick. Rick, what did you say? Ooh. Boom. All right. Jay Cliff, our favorite ice cream entrepreneur. Lauren, Kayleen, and Clark, thank you for making my Thursday afternoon enjoyable. Yes, we love welcome. you too. We love you, you too, Cliff. Um, right. And then uh, I wanted just to offer that I did this uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, normally, my consultations are $200 an hour to, to do a consultation. Um, I know everyone has a tough time right now, and uh, you might need that. Um, so I'm doing that at 75% off. So if you go to the book editor show forward slash story dash stuck, and that will tell you more about my consultations. And then you just use the coupon code, get unstuck. I can Ooh. put that in the chat, right? Maybe. Yeah. I and don't if, know. It yeah, doesn't give me I, a chat. Thing. I need to write that down. I can get that um, um, on the pod bean. I will also write that in so people can, this in the private chat and then maybe you can move it on. But. So it's, yeah, that's it. And then uh, the coupon code is get unstuck. And uh, right, got, I'd love to, I'd love to, to be able to help you get through some stuff. You know, and Clark, the, over there, over here, he is really, really easy to talk to. Um, we love having him on cause he's just, he's just a breath of fresh air. You know, he's a, uh, yeah, he's easy to talk to. And I don't I judge. Like, I really try to, like, that's one of the things. Again, circling way back to the beginning, right? Like, you're trying to put that group together and find that thing. You've got to have someone who's got an open mind because you're going to come with an idea for a story. You don't want to be with someone who's uh, got it in their head that this is the only way you can tell the story, right? So, like, having that open mind, important. All right. So, through everything that we've talked about, if you're looking for a group, if you're looking for that next collaborative partner, Going in, make sure that your end goals are aligned. You know, what genre are you wanting to write in? What kind of story, what kind of meat, what kind of feel do you want to give to the readers? Um, in a group, what do you want out of that group? Do you want marketing advice? Do you want plot advice? Do you just want a group where you can just be like, my freaking car wouldn't start this morning. It probably has a few boot prints on it because I kicked it. And yes, it did. Anyway, um, 
you know, it's know what you want out of the people that you are surrounding yourself in, that you are communicating to. And you know what? Keystroke Medium can also be that group for you. We are out there. We, if you have a problem going on, you can just put it up in there in the group. Lots of, I mean, we've got so many different walks of life in there from all across the globe. Um, come hang out with us. You never know. We, we're a family and I give you, I give you an internet hug because everybody deserves a hug these days. All right, Clark, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you. People can reach you at thebookeditorshow.com. Thebookeditorshow.com. And if uh, you want to get into, then click on the story stuck. We can actually have a one on one chat and um, get you unstuck and moving forward with your story. All righty. Thank you so much out there in YouTuber, in Facebooker, Landness. And for those that are watching it after the stakes in the pod beans and the all the other places that suddenly lost my mind that I see in the pod beans that y'all are listening to it too. Thank you so much. Please hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. We're this close ooh, to 1,000 subscribers and we want to get there so bad. You have no idea the things that unlock. It's like completing the dungeon. And we have reached the master, and he finally, with that last blow, goes down. Let us defeat the dungeon master. All right. With that, um, I lost my ending. There we go. And here it is. Here it is. Almost, almost. For Lauren Moore, I am Kayling Williams. Thank you, as always, for joining us on your writer's journey. Be sure to check us next. Check us out next week when we're going to talk about more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums. The Writer's Journey. Good night, you guys.